Matthew Walker Why We Sleep Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams, Audiobook, Part 3, Chapter 10, Dreaming as Overnight Therapy, It was long thought that dreams were simply epiphenomena of the stage of sleep, REM, from which they emerge. To illustrate the concept of epiphenomena, let's consider. The light bulb, the reason we construct the physical elements of a light bulb, the glass sphere, the coiled wire element that sits inside, the screw in electrical contact at the base, is to create light. That is the function of the light bulb, and the reason we designed the apparatus to begin with. However, a light bulb also produces heat. Heat is not the function of the light bulb, nor is it the reason we originally fashioned it. Instead, heat is simply what happens when light is generated in this way. It is an unintended byproduct of the operation, not the true function. Heat is an epiphenomenon in this case. Similarly, evolution may have gone to great lengths to construct the neural circuits in the brain that produce REM sleep and the functions that REM sleep supports. However, when the human brain produces REM sleep in this specific way, it may also produce this thing we call dreaming. Dreams, like heat from a light bulb, may serve no function. Dreams may simply be epiphenomena of no USEOR consequence. They are merely an unintended byproduct of REM sleep. Rather a depressing thought, isn't it? I'm sure many of us feel that our dream shave meaning and some useful purpose, to address this stalemate, exploring whether dreaming, beyond the stage of sleep it emerges from, has true purpose, scientists began by defining the functions of REM sleep. Once those functions were known, we could then examine whether the dreams that accompany REM sleep, and the very specific content of those dreams, were crucial determinants of those adaptive benefits. If what you dream about offers no predictive power in determining the benefits of that REM sleep, it would suggest that dreams are epiphenomenal, and REM sleep alone is sufficient, if, however, you need both REM sleep and to be dreaming about specific things to accomplish such functions, it would suggest that REM sleep alone, although necessary, is not sufficient. Rather, a unique combination of REM sleep plus dreaming, and dreaming of very particular experiences, is needed to transact these nighttime benefits. If this was proven, dreams could not be dismissed as an epiphenomenal byproduct of REM sleep. Rather, science would have to recognize dreaming as an essential part of sleep and the adaptive advantages it supports, above and beyond REM sleep itself. Using this framework, we have found two core benefits of REM sleep. Both functional benefits require not just that you have REM sleep, but that you dream, and dream about specific things. REM sleep is necessary, but REM sleep alone is not sufficient. Dreams are not the heat of the light bulb, they are no byproduct, the first function involves nursing our emotional and mental health, and is the focus of this chapter. The second is problem solving and creativity, the power of which some individuals try to harness more fully by controlling their dreams, which we treat in the next chapter, dreaming, the soothing bomb. It is said that time heals all wounds. Several years ago I decided to scientifically test this age-old wisdom, as I wondered whether an amendment was in order, perhaps it was not time that heals all wounds, but rather time spent in dream sleep. I had been developing a theory based on the combined patterns of brain activity and brain neurochemistry of REM sleep, and from this theory came a specific prediction, REM sleep dreaming offers a form of overnight therapy. That is, REM sleep dreaming takes the painful sting out of difficult, even traumatic, emotional episodes you have experienced during the day, offering emotional resolution when you awake the next morning. At the heart of the theory was an astonishing change in the chemical cocktail off your brain that takes place during REM sleep. Concentrations of a key stress-related chemical, called noradrenaline are completely shut off within your brain when you enter this dreaming sleep state. In fact, REM sleep is the only time during the 24-hour period when your brain is completely devoid of this anxiety-triggering molecule. Noradrenaline, also known as norepinephrine, is the brain equivalent to a body chemical you already know and have felt the effects of, adrenaline epinephrine. Previous MRI studies established that key emotion and memory-related structures of the brain are all reactivated during REM sleep, as we dreamed the amygdala and emotion-related regions of the cortex, and the key mnemonic center, the hippocampus. Not only did this suggest the possibility that emotion-specific memory processing was possible, if not probable, during the dreaming state, but now we understood that this emotional memory reactivation was occurring in a brain free of a key stress chemical. 
I therefore wondered whether the brain during REM sleep was reprocessing upsetting memory experiences and themes in this neurochemically calm, low noradrenaline, safe, dreaming brain. Environment. Is the REM sleep dreaming state a perfectly designed nocturnal soothing bomb, one that removes the emotional sharp edges of our daily lives? It seemed so from everything neurobiology and neurophysiology was telling us, me, if so, we should awake feeling better about distressing events of the days prior, this was the theory of overnight therapy. It postulated that the process of REM sleep dreaming accomplishes two critical goals, one, sleeping to remember the details of those valuable, salient experiences, integrating them with existing knowledge and putting them into autobiographical perspective, yet two, sleeping to forget, or dissolve, the visceral, painful emotional charge that had previously been wrapped around those memories. If true, it would suggest that the dream state supports a form of introspective life review. To therapeutic ends, think back to your childhood and try to recall some of the strongest memories you have. What you will notice is that almost all of them will be memories of an emotional nature, perhaps a particularly frightening experience of being separated from your parents, or almost being hit by a car on the street. Also notice, however, that your recall of these detailed memories is no longer accompanied by the same degree of emotion that was present at the time of the experience. You have not forgotten the memory, but you have cast off the emotional charge, or at least a significant amount of it. You can accurately relive the memory, but you do not regurgitate the same visceral reaction that was present and imprinted at the time of the episode, I the theory argued that we have. REM sleep, dreaming to thank for this palliative dissolving of emotion from experience. Through its therapeutic work at night, REM sleep performed the elegant trick of divorcing the bitter emotional rind from the information-rich fruit, we can therefore learn and usefully recall salient life events without being crippled by the emotional baggage that those painful experiences originally carried, indeed, I argued that if REM sleep did not perform this operation, we'd all be left with a state of chronic anxiety in our autobiographical memory networks. Every time we recalled something salient, not only would we recall the details of the memory, but we would relive the same stressful emotional charge all over again. Based on its unique brain activity and neurochemical composition, the dream stage of REM sleep helps us avoid this circumstance. That was the theory, those were the predictions, next came the experimental test, the results of which would take a first step toward falsifying or supporting both, we recruited a collection of healthy young adults and randomly assigned them to two groups. Each group viewed a set of emotional images while inside an MRI scanner as we measured their emotional brain reactivity. Then, 12 hours later, the participants were placed back inside the MRI scanner and we again presented those same emotional images, cueing their recollection while again measuring emotional brain reactivity. During these two exposure sessions, separated by 12 hours, participants also rated how emotional they felt in response to each image. Importantly, however, half of the participants viewed the images in the morning and again in the evening, being awake between the two viewings. The other half of the participants viewed the images in the evening and again the next morning after a full night of sleep. In this way, we could measure what their brains were objectively telling us using the MRI scans, and in addition, what participants themselves were subjectively feeling about the relived experiences, having had a night of sleep in between, or not those who slept in between the two sessions reported a significant decrease in how emotional they were feeling in response to seeing those images again. In addition, results of the MRI scans showed a large and significant reduction in reactivity in the amygdala, that emotional center of the brain that creates painful feelings. Moreover, there was a re-engagement of the rational prefrontal cortex of the brain after sleep that was helping maintain a dampening break influence one emotional reactions. In contrast, those who remained awake across the day without the chance to sleep and digest those experiences showed no such dissolving of emotional reactivity over time. Their deep emotional brain reactions were just as strong and negative, if not more so, at the second viewing compared with the first, and they reported a similarly powerful re-experiencing of painful feelings to boot, since we had recorded the sleep of each participant during the intervening 
night, between the two test sessions, we could answer a follow-up question, is there something about the type or quality of sleep that an individual experiences that predicts how successful sleep is at accomplishing next-day emotional resolution? As the theory predicted, it was the dreaming state of REM sleep, and specific patterns of electrical activity that reflected the drop in stress-related brain chemistry during the dream state, that determined the success of overnight therapy from one individual to the next. It was not therefore, time per se that healed all wounds, but instead it was time spent in dream sleep that was providing emotional convalescence. To sleep, perchance to heal, sleep, and specifically REM sleep, was clearly needed in order for us to heal. Emotional wounds. But was the act of dreaming during REM sleep, and event dreaming of those emotional events themselves, necessary to achieve resolution and keep our minds safe from the clutches of anxiety and reactive depression? This was the question that Dr. Rosalind Cartwright at Rush University in Chicago elegantly dismantled in a collection of work with her clinical patients, Cartwright, who I contend is as much a pioneer in dream research as Sigmund Freud, decided to study the dream content of people who were showing signs of depression as a consequence of incredibly difficult emotional experiences, such as devastating breakups and bitter divorces. Right around the time of the emotional trauma, she started collecting their nightly dream reports and sifted through them, hunting for clear signs of the same emotional themes emerging in their dream lives relative to their waking lives. Cartwright then performed follow-up assessments up to one year later, determining whether the patient's depression and anxiety caused by the emotional trauma were resolved or continued to persist. In a series of publications that I still revisit with admiration to this day, Cartwright demonstrated that it was only those patients who were expressly dreaming about the painful experiences around the time of the events who went in to gain clinical resolution from their despair. Mentally recovering a year later is clinically determined by having no identifiable depression. Those who were dreaming, but not dreaming of the painful experience itself, could not get past the event, still being dragged down by a strong undercurrent of depression that remained. Cartwright had shown that it was not enough to have REM sleep, or even generic dreaming, when it comes to resolving our emotional past. Her patients required REM sleep with dreaming, but dreaming of a very specific kind, that which expressly involved dreaming. About the emotional themes and sentiments of the waking trauma. It was only that content-specific form of dreaming that was able to accomplish clinical remission and offer emotional closure in these patients, allowing them to move forward into a new emotional future, and not being slaved by a traumatic past. Cartwright's data offered further psychological affirmation of our biological overnight therapy theory, but it took a chance meeting at a conference one in Clement Saturday in Seattle before my own basic research and theory would be translated from bench to bedside, helping to resolve the crippling psychiatric condition of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, patients with PTSD, who are so often war veterans, have a difficult time recovering from horrific trauma experiences. They are frequently plagued by daytime flashbacks of these intrusive memories and suffer reoccurring nightmares. I wondered whether the REM sleep overnight therapy mechanism we had discovered in healthy individuals had broken down in people suffering from PTSD, thereby failing to help them deal with their trauma memories effectively. When a veteran soldier suffers a flashback triggered by, say, a car backfiring, they can relive the whole visceral traumatic experience again. It suggested to me that the emotion had not been properly stripped away from the traumatic memory during sleep. If you interview PTSD patients in the clinic, they will often tell you that they just cannot get over the experience. In part, they are describing a brain that has not detoxed the emotion from the trauma memory, such that every time the memory is relived the flashback, so. Two, is the emotion, which has not been effectively removed, already, we knew that the sleep, especially the REM sleep, of patients suffering from PTSD was disrupted. There was also evidence suggesting that PTSD patients shot higher than normal levels of noradrenaline released by their nervous system, building on our overnight therapy theory of REM sleep dreaming and the emerging data that supported it, I wrote a follow-up theory, applying the model to PTSD. The theory proposed that a contributing mechanism underlying the PTSD is the excessively high levels of noradrenaline within the brain that blocks the ability of these patients from entering and maintaining normal REM sleep dreaming. 
As a consequence, their brain at night cannot strip away the emotion from the trauma memory, since the stress chemical environment is too high, most compelling to me, however, were the repetitive nightmares reported INPTSD patients, a symptom so reliable that it forms part of the list of features required for a diagnosis of the condition. If the brain cannot divorce the emotion from memory across the first night following a trauma experience, the theory suggests that a repeat attempt of emotional memory stripping will occur on the second night, as the strength of the emotional tag associated with the memory remains too high. If the process fails a second time, the same attempt will continue to repeat the next night, and the next night, like a broken record. This was precisely what appeared to be happening with the recurring nightmares of the trauma experience in PTSD patients. A testable prediction emerged, if I could lower the levels of noradrenaline in the brains of PTSD patients during sleep, thereby reinstating the right chemical conditions for sleep to do its trauma therapy work, then I should be able to restore healthier quality REM sleep. With that restored REM sleep quality should come an improvement in the clinical symptoms of PTSD, and further, a decrease in the frequency of painful repetitive nightmares. It was a scientific theory in search of clinical evidence. Then came the wonderful stroke of serendipity. Soon after my theoretical paper was published, I met Dr. Murray Raskind, a remarkable physician who worked at a U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs hospital in the Seattle area. We were both presenting our own research findings at a conference in Seattle and, at the time, we were each unaware of the author's emerging new research data. Raskind, a tall man with kindly eyes whose disarmingly relaxed, jocular demeanor belies a clinical acumen that is not to be underestimated, is a prominent research figure in both the PTSD and Alzheimer's disease fields. At the conference, Raskind presented recent findings that were perplexing to him. In his PTSD clinic, Raskind had been treating his war veteran patients with a generic drug called prazosin to manage their high blood pressure. While the drug was somewhat effective for lowering blood pressure in the body, Raskind found it had a far more powerful yet entirely unexpected benefit within the brain, it alleviated the reoccurring nightmares in his PTSD patients. After only a few weeks of treatment, his patients would return to the clinic and, with puzzled amazement, say things like, Doc, it's the strangest thing, my dreams don't have those flashback nightmares anymore. I feel better, less scared to fall asleep at night, it turns out that the drug prazosin, which Raskind was prescribing simply to lower blood pressure, also has the fortuitous side effect of suppressing noradrenaline in the brain. Raskind had delightfully and inadvertently conducted the experiment I was trying to conceive of myself. He had created precisely the neurochemical condition, a lowering of the abnormally high concentrations of stress-related noradrenaline within the brain during REM sleep that had been absent for so long in these PTSD patients. Prazosin was gradually lowering the harmful high tide of noradrenaline within the brain, giving these patients healthier REM sleep quality. With healthy REM sleep came a reduction in the patient's clinical symptoms and, most critically, a decrease in the frequency of their repetitive nightmares. Raskind and I continued our communications and scientific discussions. Throughout that conference, he subsequently visited my lab at UC Berkeley in the months that followed, and we talked non-stop throughout the day and into the evening over dinner about my neurobiological model of overnight emotional therapy, and how it seemed to perfectly explain his clinical findings with prazosin these were hairs on the back of your neck standing up conversations perhaps the most exciting i have ever experienced in my career the basic scientific theory was no longer in search of clinical confirmation the two had found each other on sky leaking day in seattle mutually informed by each other's work and based on the strength of Raskind's studies and now several large-scale independent clinical trials prazosin has become the officially approved drug by the va for the treatment of repetitive trauma nightmares and has since received approval by the u.s food and drug administration for the same benefit many questions remain to be addressed including more independent replication of the findings in other types of trauma such as sexual abuse or violence it is also not a perfect medication due to side effects at higher doses, and not every individual responds to the treatment with the same success. But it is a start. We now have a scientifically informed explanation of one function of REM sleep and the dreaming process inherent in it, and from that knowledge we have 
taken the first steps toward treating the distressing and disabling clinical condition of PTSD. It may also unlock new treatment avenues regarding sleep and other mental illness, including depression, dreaming to decode waking experiences. Just when I thought REM sleep had revealed all it could offer to our mental health, a second emotional brain advantage gifted by REM sleep came to light, one that is arguably more survival-relevant, accurately reading expressions and emotions of faces is a prerequisite of being a functional human being, and indeed, a functional higher primate of most kinds, facial expressions represent one of the most important signals in our environment. They communicate the emotional state and intent of an individual and, if we interpret them correctly, influence our behavior in return. There are regions of your brain whose job it is to read and decode the value and meaning of emotional signals, especially faces. And it is that very same essential set of brain regions, or network, that REM sleep recalibrates at night. In this different and additional role, we can think of REM sleep like a master piano tuner, one that readjusts the brain's emotional instrumentation at night to pitch perfect precision, so that when you wake up the next morning, you can discern overt and subtly covert micro expressions with exactitude, deprive an individual of their REM sleep dreaming state, and the emotional tuning curve of the brain loses its razor sharp precision. Like viewing an image through frosted glass, or looking at an out-of-focus picture, a dream-starved brain cannot accurately decode facial expressions, which become distorted. You begin to mistake friends for foes, we made this discovery by doing the following. Participants came into my laboratory and had a full night of sleep. The following morning, we showed them many pictures of a specific individual's face. However, no two pictures were the same. Instead, the facial expression of that one individual varied across the images in a gradient, shifting from friendly, with a slight smile, calming eye aperture, and approachable look, to increasingly stern and threatening, pursed lips, a furrowed brow, and a menacing look in the eyes. Each image of this individual was subtly different from those on either side of it on the emotional gradient, and across tens of pictures, the full range of intent was expressed, from very prosocial, friendly, to strongly antisocial, unfriendly, participants viewed the faces in a random fashion while we scanned their brains in an MRI machine, and they rated how approachable or threatening the images were. The MRI scans allowed us to measure how their brains were. Interpreting and accurately parsing the threatening facial expressions from the friendly ones after having had a full night of sleep. All the participants repeated the same experiment, but this time we deprived them of sleep, including the critical stage of REM. Half of the participants went through the sleep deprivation session first, followed by the sleep session second, and vice versa. In each session, a different individual was featured in the pictures, so there was no memory or repetition effects. Having had a full night of sleep, which contained REM sleep, participants demonstrated a beautifully precise tuning curve of emotional face recognition, rather like a stretched out V-shape. When navigating the cornucopia of facial expressions we showed them inside the MRI scanner, their brains had no problem deftly separating one emotion from another across the delicately changing gradient, and the accuracy of their own ratings proved this to be similarly true. It was effortless to disambiguate friendly and approachable signals from those intimating even minor threat as the emotional tide changed toward the foreboding, confirming the importance of the dream state, the better the quality of REM sleep from one individual to the next across that rested night, the more precise. The tuning within the emotional decoding networks of the brain the next day, through this platinum-grade nocturnal service, better REM sleep quality at night provided superior comprehension of the social world the next day, but when those same participants were deprived of sleep, including the essential influence of REM sleep, they could no longer distinguish one emotion from another with accuracy. The tuning V of the brain had been changed, rudely pulled all the way up from the base and flattened into a horizontal line, as if the brain was in a state of generalized hypersensitivity without the ability to map gradations of emotional signals from the outside world. Gone was the precise ability to read giveaway clues in another's face. The brain's emotional navigation system had lost its true magnetic north of directionality and sensitivity, a compass that otherwise guides us toward numerous evolutionary advantages, with the absence of such emotional acuity, normally gifted by the re-tuning skills of REM sleep at night, the sleep-deprived participants slipped into a default.
of fear bias, believing even gentle or somewhat friendly looking faces were menacing. The outside world had become a more threatening and aversive place when the brain lacked REM sleep, untruthfully so. Reality and perceived reality were no longer the same in the eyes of the sleepless brain. By removing REM sleep, we had, quite literally, removed participants' level-headed ability to read the social world around them. Now think of occupations that require individuals to be sleep-deprived, such as law enforcement and military personnel, doctors, nurses, and those in the emergency services, not to mention the ultimate caretaking job, new parents, every one of these roles demands the accurate ability to read the emotions of fathers in order to make critical, even life-dependent, decisions, such as detecting a true threat that requires the use of weapons, assessing emotional discomfort or anguish that can change a diagnosis, the extent of palliative pain medication prescribed, or deciding when to express compassion or dispense an assertive parenting lesson without REM sleep and its ability to reset the brain's emotional compass, those same individuals will be inaccurate in their social and emotional comprehension of the world around them, leading to inappropriate decisions and actions that may have grave consequences. Looking across the lifespan, we have discovered that this REM sleep recalibration service comes into its own just prior to the transition into adolescence. Before that, when children are still under close watch from there, Parents, and many salient assessments and decisions are made by mom and, or dad, REM sleep provides less of a re-tuning benefit to a child's brain. But come the early teenage years and the inflection point of parental independence wherein an adolescent must navigate the socio-emotional world for himself, now we see the young brain feasting on this emotional recalibration benefit of REM sleep. That is not to suggest that REM sleep is unnecessary. For children or infants, it very moochies, as it supports other functions we have discussed, brain development, and will next discuss creativity. Rather, it is that this particular function of REM sleep, which takes hold at a particular developmental milestone, allows the burgeoning pre-adult brain to steer itself through the turbulent waters of a complex emotional world with autonomy, we shall return to this topic in the penultimate chapter when we discuss the damage that early school start times are having on our teenagers. Most significant is the issue of sunrise school bus schedules that selectively deprive our teenagers of that early morning slumber, just at the moment in their sleep cycle when their developing brains are about to drink in most of their much-needed REM sleep. We're bankrupting their dreams, in so many different ways.